Good morning. Or good afternoon. This is 3 a.m. 4 a. Uh, today, I am going to demonstrate for you a lab um, with a couple of reactions. We're going to create a closed system uh, and then run reactions in those closed systems. Uh, before we start, I would like you to hit pause and read through both the introduction and the procedure of these two labs so you have a better idea of what's going on. So take a second, pause, and read those for me. I'm assuming that you are now resuming this video, that you have read the introduction. Uh, we're segueing into our unit on chemical reactions. And so what I'm going to demonstrate for you today are two different chemical reactions. I'm going to give you some masses. I'm going to help you with some observations. And you are going to analyze the information that we generate together via this demo. Um, I am going to read through the steps as we uh, go through this process, just to kind of model uh, how you work through labs. Normally, you would be doing this lab. Uh, in person. It's not that hazardous. We do have some chemicals we have to be um, aware of. So just as a tiny bit of a, a safety lesson as part of this, I will be wearing goggles and aprons the entire lab. My most dangerous chemical that I'm working with is hydrochloric acid. Um, hydrochloric acid is one of the three strong acids along with sulfuric and nitric. Uh, I'm also working with acetic acid, that's basically vinegar. And then my two compounds that I'm working with are sodium bicarbonate, you might have this in your home as baking soda, and zinc powder. Zinc is just a metal, it's a transition metal, and uh, in its powdered form, it just looks like a black powder. You'll see it in a little more detail in a minute. So as we go into our unit on, on chemical reactions, the first thing that we have to think about is the law of conservation of matter or the law of conservation of mass. When you have a chemical reaction, you are not creating or destroying atoms. You're simply rearranging them into new substances. Uh, so this is going to kind of demonstrate that. And it's kind of the rationale for why you have to learn to balance chemical equations. You can't have chemical equations written that appear to create or destroy atoms. There have to be the same number of atoms of each type on both sides. When we're talking about a chemical reaction, everything you start with is called a reactant. And we have it on the left of the arrow. And everything we generate is called a product. Let me go back to uh, Full screen for just a second so you can see what I wrote. So what you start with is a reactant or reactants if you have more than one, and what you generate is products or products if you have more than one. So I'm going to be using that language today as I do this demonstration. So um, as we go through this, I'm going to uh, stop sharing or share my sorry. Sorry about that. Trying to get stuff where I can see what I need to see so that you can see what you need to see. So let's read through the steps of this procedure and we will um, note some masses and some information that you'll have to record in the data table. So you can go up and down through it, but um, what you probably should be looking at right now is the data for part one. So we're going to be adding information to that. So the first step that we have to take is to place 50 milliliters of hydrochloric acid into a 250 ml beaker. So here is my hydrochloric acid. Um, I never want to put my stopper on the table because that could contaminate my acid. And I always want to use a graduated cylinder for measuring. When you see measurements on an Erlenmeyer flask like this, they are incredibly rough. Uh, the only reason there's actually little measurements on there is to give you a visual of how full your flask will be. They're not accurate. So we always use a graduated cylinder for volume. Um, I want to do 50, so I always want to find that up front and put my thumb there so I kind of see approximately where I'm pouring. 
Note that as I tour, I am keeping my graduated cylinder on a flat surface. That way, if I accidentally spill, um, it doesn't splash everywhere. Like if I was holding it up here and I overflowed it and go everywhere. Um, I've got just a little more than I needed, but this lab is qualitative as opposed to quantitative. And what I mean by that is the reaction part is going to react whether I have a little too much of one or the other, but I am doing measurements. So I'm going to put that into my Erlenmeyer flash, and I'm going to get it to map. That was my step one. Uh, this is the balance I'm using, just to let you see it. Um, there's always a button on a balance that says zero, or usually say, or it might say tear, and that means take me back to zero. You always want your balance on 0, 0.0 before you measure to make sure it's accurate. So here is my 50 mils plus or minus of hydrochloric acid in my Erlenmeyer flask. And my mass is 186.48. Let me double check the ratio. 48. So this is uh, the flask with HCl. I believe it's the first line in the table. So my second step after I've done that is to place eight grams of zinc into a balloon. So I'm going to put my balloon on to get a rough idea of how much it weighs. This weighs around 2.83 grams, so around three grams. If I want to add eight, that means I'm taking it up to around 11 grams. Once more, I do not have to be crazy precise with this. Um, I just want to document how much I start with mass-wise and how much I end with. Okay, so I'm at almost nine grams, so I still need a little more. And now I'm at 11.34 grams. Remember I said I wanted to get to around 11 grams. So that's the next thing I wanna write down is, and you'll need to add that to your data table as well, 11.34 grams. This is the balloon with the zinc. My third step asks me to get this balloon onto my flask without adding what's inside. So I'm going to stretch it a little. And then I am going to slide it over the mouth of my flask without getting any in. I want to do that pretty carefully so I don't accidentally tear it. And now I want to take the mass together. So my mass together is 197.8. Eight one. So, in theory, these two should add up to this, do they? Well, we actually have a line in our data table for this. Let me go back and double check which line is which. So, technically, this is number one, this is number two, and this is number four. In between was a line. This is math of all, I'm not writing all of that out. And we said that was 197.81. So what do these add up to? These add up to 197.82. Now, should these be different? No. Why are they different? Well, my balance is accurate to plus or minus. 0 0.02. That's how accurate my balance is. So this very last number could be off by as much as 0 0.02. All balances have their limits of accuracy. So am I within the range of error? Yeah, I'm, I'm off by 0.01, and that's okay. 
uh, that's a limit to my balance situation. So I have now done steps one, two, and three. So what I'm going to do now is I want to feel my temperature beforehand. So if I feel this, I'm kind of getting a sense of its temperature. It's just a little cooler than room temperature. Um, it's not warm at all. So it's just kind of a room temperature feel. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually combine my ingredients. So I'm going to hold this up and let the ingredients fall in. You can see what's happening is there's a lot of bubbling and what's happening to my balloon. So you want to make a notation in your observations. What happens to the balloon? What do you see happen down here? Uh, there's a lot of bubbling. You can also see a tiny bit of water vapor forming on the upper top. It looks like maybe a little steam is being given off. And when I feel this, it's quite hot, like outside of a teacup when you just made fresh tea hot, outside of a coffee, coffee cup when you have fresh coffee in it. It's very hot actually right now. So this takes a little while to react. So I'm going to go ahead and set up the second part. So in the second part, I'm basically doing the same thing, except instead of using hydrochloric acid and zinc, I'm using acetic acid and, and sodium bicarbonate. So going down to procedure part two, we're going to come back and get number five for that first data table. Don't forget you want to write observations of what's happened um, to the left, I mean to the right of that data table where it says changes observed. So in part two, my first step is to get 50 mils of acetic acid. That's this one. And you're going to add that to the flask. I actually put 50 mils in here already. So I'm going to weigh this. So my acetic acid in my Erlenmeyer flask for my second reaction. is going to be 168.66. 168.66, in case you can't see that. It looks like you can see it on the video. So after I've got my acetic acid in my flask, I'm going to basically do the same thing I did the first time, except this time, instead of putting zinc in the balloon, I'm going to put sodium bicarbonate. And you'll see my mass is a little different too. I want 15 grams. Once again, my initial mass of my balloon is this one is 3.36. So I want to add 15 grams. So 3 plus 15 is going to be around 18. Now, this one takes quite a bit. So I just found that from experience. So I'm going to do several scoops here. And a 13. Remember, I want to get up to 18 or 18 and a half. I'm at 18.5. So that is just what I need. So let's write that up here. Our mass of the balloon. And the sodium bicarbonate was 18.56 grams. So remember, the next thing we were going to do was to add those together. And so when we add these together, we get 12, 2. Really bad when your teacher is doing mental math in front of you because she's likely to make an error. 
Maybe it's that 187.22 grams when we add them up. And then lastly, I'm actually going to put them together and weigh them. So once again, I want to stretch this out a little. It would be horribly inconvenient if I tore this when I'm about to show it to you. Okay, let's weigh these together then. 187.22. So when I actually weigh them, I get the same thing. Once again, the reason why I didn't get the same thing, uh, like here when they added up, they weren't perfectly identical, was just because of a tiny bit of a range of error on the balance. So the next thing I'm going to do is I am once again going to kind of feel it before I start. Um, both of these uh, solutions were just at room temperature. So to my hand, they feel, feel a tiny bit cool, but not actually cold or warm. So now I want to uh, carefully add this. I'm going to try to add it not all at once so I don't overdo the reaction. out. So when I feel this one now, I can feel it actually getting a little cooler. And you can see that this reaction, reaction is still happening a little. This one's already almost done. It's got a tiny bit of bubbling left. So it happened much more quickly. The bubbling was much less dramatic. And it's actually cold. Okay, usually the balloon float, uh, inflates a little more than that, but I cannot control that. So the next step I'm supposed to take after these reactions have happened, and by the way, if you look at this one, it is really hot now, and there is still a tiny little bit of bubbling. This reaction takes a long time to completely finish. So we're actually going to, but we've got about 99% of the reaction and the gap that can be made. So what I want to do now is weigh this after. So after this weighs 194, one ninety four point three two. And this one after weighs one eighty six point seven one. So do make sure that you have all of these masses in your data table. You can rewind and get those if you not you did it. Once again, this was. After it was 186.71. This feels cooler than it did to begin with. It actually feels a little cold now as opposed to room temperature. And you can see the reaction went much more quickly. This one does not have any condensation inside. This one has quite a bit. So I know that some of the water in this situation converted to water vapor. So let's talk about. What you're going to do next, you should have both data tables filled in. You should have observations made. One observation, don't forget to make an observation about what happened to the balloons and then the comparative sizes of the balloons. This was part one, this was part two. Um, I'm actually going to clean up, but before I do, I want to. Uh, show you one thing. I'm going to tie these off. And I just want to kind of show you the comparative mass of these balloons. Obviously, this one didn't get inflated as much. But maybe that means it has less gas, which means the gas has less mass, right? The balloon part still weighs the same. 
So one thing I'd like you to observe is if I toss these both up, and instead of using my hands to toss, I'm going to use my knees to kind of give a more, uh, to give them both about the same amount of push up, is look, look at the difference in the balloons as I send them up. So this was the balloon from part one. And this was the balloon from part two. What do you, what other observation can you make about maybe the, the heaviness of these gases? <laughs> this one is actually quite light. It does not float up on its own, but it does go up. This one comparatively is pretty heavy. So um, I'll set those there, if that will stay there. So what you're going to work on now is you are going to go through some of these questions uh, and you're going to just type directly into this document. Your goal is to finish these questions and submit them. We're going to come back about 20 minutes before the block is over and I will give you some tips. Uh, one question that is asked on eight and nine it asks you for some possible gases. What gas might you guess it would be? Um, so just as one other little bit of information, these are some of the common environmental gases that are generated in various chemical reactions. This would be water vapor. Nitrogen is a common gas. Argon is a common gas. So these are the common gases that you would want to consider for questions eight or nine. And here's one tip I can give you. Look at what you're starting with. We had two reactions. Uh, one reaction was we took zinc plus hydrochloric acid. So think about the elements that are found in our starting substances. Those are the only elements you can find in your product. We can't, like we couldn't make argon, right? We don't have argon as one of our reactants. And then the other reaction that we did was sodium bicarbonate plus acetic acid. So those were our two reactions. If you can't see those, we will talk about that some more when you guys come back. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to work on this and um, get as much of this answered as possible. I will not be spoon feeding you answers, but we will talk through some of the, some of the topics when we get back so you can make corrections um, or add to it. But we're gonna come back uh, 20 minutes before the end of the block to take a few questions. Um, until then though, you're on your own. Just watch this video, hopefully it's helpful. And see how many of those questions you can answer. Uh, good luck. <laughs>